Clinic and why cancer is an important part of what we do here. Now, I have to make a very important distinction that Dr. Reardon made early on, is, and he used to say this every time. He says, we do not take care of cancer. We take care of the person who has cancer. And a lot of people say, well, isn't that just playing with words? And the answer is no. It's not playing with words. You know, as you, as you are all aware, cancer is very serious business. Uh, we have an excellent cancer tumor treatment program in the United States, in the world, but that program does not always address the patient who has cancer, the diet, the lifestyle, the uh, environmental factors that may be playing a role, low-grade infections, various things that enter into that cancer process that may be causing the cancer or prom promoting the cancer. So we have focused on what we can do to help the patient have a better outcome, to, to have a better quality of life as they, are, as they are attempting to rid themselves of the cancer. So to that end, it was with great excitement that I first met uh, Dr. Timms in this very room almost what was about exactly a year ago. Yep, next that month. We, uh, Dr. Thomas Levy and I were, were presenting the IBC Academy which is an academy for doctors and practitioners who want to learn how to do intravenous vitamin C. And lo and behold, here was this good-looking uh, naturopathic doctor in the audience. And in talking with Lucas, we f I found out that he had been working for seven, eight years at eight years. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And I says, aha, so, you, so this is very interesting. And I knew about Cancer Treatment Centers of America's use of uh, naturopathic doctors and so so one thing led to another and so here we have Dr. Thames he is he is certified as a uh, naturopathic oncologist or how would you say it yeah naturopathic oncologist and so it is our great pleasure that he is joining the Reardon Clinic now he will be stationed in Kansas City at our at our satellite clinic there and so uh, so he will be available in that way, and, and he'll be coming to Wichita now and then. And so, anyway, with no, without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Lucas Tess. I think I'm good. You guys hear me okay? Coming through? Great. Um, that was a great, you know, introduction and segue, Dr. Ron, thank you so much. Uh, and I think a lot of what you, you know, encapsulated in those first few, uh, remarks are, you know, a lot of what I'm going to continue to kind of talk about today. Um, but just want to thank everybody for coming, obviously, and helping to um, welcome me here to the Reardon Clinic. I'm excited to be part of the team here. Uh, it's been um, a long road since last October when I did first, you know, come here and meet them. But uh, I feel like even just being here for the past week and getting plugged in with the staff and, and everybody, it just feels like home. Um, I'm really, uh, I'm really fortunate to be part of the team here, and so I'm just looking forward to starting to see patients. And uh, I think it's, I was talking uh, with uh, someone earlier. Just, it's been almost two months since I've actually had a, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one patient, uh, you know, uh, a contact. And so I'm itching to kind of get back to that because that's really where my passion's at is just, you know, those one-on-one -on -one interactions and, and, and working with the patients directly. So. Um, but I thought today would be good just to sort of give you guys a, a, a look at where I've been with my training, what naturopathic oncology is all about, and, um, and then we can kind of, you know, parlay that into lots of questions and, and, and discussion. Um, I do have some objectives just to sort of keep us on track here, but we will look at, you know, what, what naturopathic oncology is, um, how it differs from other types of, of oncology specialties, uh, look at the training involved, look at, you know, some of the patient demand that has created this niche, because um, there's actually a lot of information out there as far as the t statistics and use of alternative medicine in cancer patients. Uh, I did, uh, uh, we'll touch on some of the research that's being done in integrative oncology and, and, and more natural therapies in, in, in cancer care and some of the specific therapies that have really good evidence behind them. And we'll also look at case studies, which I just put a few, you know, short ones in at the end, just to give you guys a little bit of that real world flavor to kind of get an idea of how I practice, what my treatment plans kind of look like for patients. 
And, um, and then, of course, we'll, we'll do some questions at the end. So kind of take a step back first. Um, you know, I always think of naturopathic medicine as a specialty in and of itself, right? When you look at the, the large framework of our med medical model, you, know, you have all these specialists, and it, it makes sense that you have someone at the doctor level that does have specialty or, 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 or specialty training in the application of natural therapies, right? That's, that's really what naturopathic medicine is all about. And so I guess you could say naturopathic oncology is sort of a subspecialty. Um, because it really is just taking those principles of naturopathic medicine and applying them to a specific population, you know, which is cancer patients. Um, NDs go to, you know, I don't know how, how many of you guys are aware of the training for, for naturopathic medicine uh, or naturopathic doctors, but the, the four years of medical school looks very similar to medical doctors and osteopathic doctors. Uh, we go through two years of basic sciences, two years of clinical sciences, and uh, where we differ is that towards the last couple of years, they start to weave in more of the introduction to natural therapies like, like you know, supplements and vitamins and uh, nutrition, uh, diet therapies, um, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, homeopathy. There's, there's a lot of different modalities that are kind of covered under that umbrella. Um, and so, and we also do learn, you know, pharmacology as well, and we do minor surgery techniques as well. So, the actual medical school portion of it isn't, doesn't look that much different on paper, um, but, but a lot of the philosophy is also being taught throughout that, those four years. And the philosophy is really another area where naturopathic medicine differs from uh, conventional medicine, and Dr. Ron touched on this, and that it's, it's you know, they're much more disease-focused. And, and, and the naturopathic approach and the Reardon approach as well is much more patient-focused. Um, but, you know, after you complete medical school, in the conventional model, you go on and you do a residency, two or three years of that, and that's really where you're honing your skills, right? I mean, when you, when you graduate medical school, you have all this information in your head, and you're, you know, you're technically a doctor, but you don't really know how to practice medicine, and that's where residency comes in. Unfortunately, for the naturopathic profession, there's not enough residency opportunities uh, for every ND to be able to, 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 to do a residency. So some of them have to go directly into practice and, you know, there's, there's mentorships and preceptorships and things where they can get some sort of guidance, but it's not like a full-blown residency program. I was lucky enough to be accepted into a, a fairly highly competitive residency program through Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Uh, it was a two-year oncology-focused residency, and um, it you know, it, it really puts you through the ringer. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you all are familiar with Cancer Treatment Centers of America, but they have a, it's an all-in-one sort of cancer center. They have an inpatient unit, they're outpatient clinics, they have all the specialists that are involved in cancer care there. They do labs in-house, imaging. Uh, so I got a chance to spend time with all of these different facets uh, of care, not just the naturopathic side, uh, during my residency. And and it really has helped to shape the way that I, that I view oncology and, and, and more so integrative oncology and, and the collaboration between all the different fields because uh, you really need it. You know, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it takes a really good multidisciplinary team, I think, to, to do cancer care the right way. And CTCA is, is, is really great at that. And I'm just, I, I was blessed to be able to go through that training. So that set me up um, to... Um, to, to become specialized in oncology. We'll see on the next slide, there's some other avenues you can go through to, to, to sit for that board certification, but the easiest way is to do one of those oncology-focused residencies. Um, but um, ideally, as a naturopathic oncologist, we want to be present and we want to be part of the team from the beginning to the end. Unfortunately, a lot of patients don't come to us until the end. <laughs> Um, but I think in order to get the most out of integrative therapies and naturopathic therapies, the earlier you start them, the better. Um, you know, pre-diagnosis, right? We, we, we want to see patients at stage zero is what I always tell, you know, a lot of people. Um, and so a lot of the things that we do are more preventative anyway. So it's the earlier you get them, the, the, the less likely you are to develop a, uh, uh, an advanced stage uh, type case. But, you know, even when patients do come to us at the end, there's always value we can, we can bring to them. There's always quality of life improvement 
There's, there's always easing of suffering. Um, but like I said, ideally, we like to be there from the beginning. And some of that's just, you know, working on that collaboration with some of the other, the other you know, uh, people in the field, the other oncologists. So here's, uh, you know, the, the training that I talked about. So here's the, the residency option that I did. Um, or the other option is if you didn't get into a residency or didn't do a residency is to, you know, you have to have been in practice for five years seeing a, a certain amount of, you know, patient contact hours specific to oncology. Um, and then they have to go through, um, you know, uh, submitting a bunch of cases and basically just proving that they've, they've done the work, right? They have this, this a certain level of experience working with cancer patients and that the things that they've recommended have been appropriate and you know that they're not doing stuff outside of the the general scope of what naturopathic oncology is about uh, and then you know those two options if you get through that you sit for a board exam and uh, if you pass then of course you're you know you're awarded this board certification it's a it's a recertification every 10 years so I'm already um, thinking about my recertification I got to do in 2024, I guess it'll be. Um, not looking forward to that. But it's good because it keeps people current on, on what's going on in the profession. It's not like you just take the exam and then, you know, you're certified for life. So this is, um, this slide's more about the, that whole person approach, right, that I talked about and Dr. Ron talks about. Um, you know, we have several principles of naturopathic medicine, but some of them that really stand out in terms of cancer care uh, are, uh, you know, this, this idea that, that all systems are, are, can't be separated, right? Mind, body, spirit, and the environment. This one oftentimes gets left out. You know, a lot of people just say the mind, body, and soul, mind, body, and spirit, but the environment is so crucial, and especially when it comes to cancer, uh, we're just... Uh, learning more and more about how our environment influences not only our um, uh, our health, but on a cellular level, on a genetic level. You know, that, that's this whole um, field of epigenetics, right? Whether it's the the chemicals we're exposed to, or the uh, the relationships, or or the food we're eating, it's it, it, it's that's all part of our environment. Uh, the 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 fact that, uh, you know, we do have this concept that the body has its, you know, innate healing ability. And oftentimes what we're trying to do is just remove the obstacles for cure and let the body kind of do what it does. Um, of course, there's some, you know, some stimulation of vitality and things that go along with that. But anytime you can remove obstacles to cure, like things in the environment or a poor diet or you know, lack of exercise. I mean, that you oftentimes get the most bang for your buck with those types of things. Uh, and that leads right into the lifestyle factors. Again, epigenetics, stress, uh, diet, uh, uh, relationships, um, the air we breathe, the, the water we drink, all that. It's all lifestyle and, and environment. Uh, and then this, this notion that you know, all patients are biochemically unique or biochemically individual. And so I always tell my patients that I'm more interested in what makes you different than the next patient, than I am what, what you might have in common with them, okay? Um, so you might have four breast cancer patients, and they're going to have similarities. They're going to have, um, you know, common symptoms and common you know issues and risk factors and all that but oftentimes the clues to figuring out a patient's case are what makes those cases different okay so it's a little bit it's a little it's just a it, it's it's a different approach uh, this one is kind of of course you know you have to listen you have to engage naturopathic doctors obviously we're not usually part of the the insurance system so we can spend more time with patients which is nice uh, but listening is such an important part of the doctor-patient relationship because I firmly believe that allowing a patient to sit and tell you their story is very therapeutic, okay? And just being a good listener uh, can go a long way and actually even start some of that, some of that healing process for them. And then this down here, I think, falls right in line with the, the, the term they use here, co-learners, right? Um, the patients have to play an active role, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a partnership. Doctor and patient, it's a partnership. We can give you the, 
the guidance, the tools, the education. But at the end of the day, you know, the patients have to be the ones that execute that plan and, and stick with it. Okay, so I thought I would just put, uh, put some of the data in here as far as the, the patient demand that I talked about. Um, the, the, the central theme is that cancer patients specifically are, have been shown to be very high users, heavy users of complementary and alternative medicine. And that cre can create, um, I mean, it's a good thing, but at the same time, I think a lot of patients aren't doing it in a structured or guided way, working alongside a, you know, a professional like myself or someone who has knowledge in how to apply natural therapies to cancer care. And so there's this hole uh, where patients are use, utilizing natural therapies. They may have just read about it on the internet or a well-meaning friend or family recommended it. They're not always sharing that information with their oncologist or their primary care doctor. Um, so, and you know, sometimes they're fearful that there might be, you know, backlash from them or they're ashamed. I don't know. And sometimes the doctors, you know, they don't want to talk about it. So the patient's don't want to discuss it. And so the, it just has created a real gap in, 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 in care, I think, when it comes to patients getting good, solid, evidence-based recommendations as far as how to utilize natural therapies. Because the last thing we want are patients trying to doctor themselves with this stuff. There, there's a lot of stuff that patients can learn and, and put into use on their own, especially when it comes to more lifestyle factors. But anytime you're doing, you know, high-dose herbs, high-dose vitamins, high-dose supplements, um, especially if you're going through cancer treatment, some of those things might cause interference with some drugs, might cause interference with chemotherapy. You might not be taking, or, or you may be taking too high of a dose. You may have other comorbid conditions, which would not be a good setup for using certain types of supplements. Um, so anyways, just there's a real, there, there's obviously a real need for this. And the oncologists I've worked with over the years at CTCA, they absolutely get this. Uh, I mean, when you show them, you know, statistics and then they start to see the importance of, of having someone on their team that can deal with this type of stuff with their patients, but they get on board really quickly, you know. And even the ones that were, you know, like absolutely like, no, I don't want anything to do with natural medicine and it's, it's witch, witchcraft, whatever, um, they're the, sometimes the ones that become the biggest supporters once they actually get on board with what we do. And they, I mean, frankly, their patients do better. So why wouldn't they want us on board? They have fewer side effects. They have better quality of life. They complain less to the oncologist. Their treatments are usually on schedule. And they have better overall responses. So the buy-in is there. We just need to, we need to have better communication between um, you know, people on my side of the fence and, and the, the conventional model. So again, just another big survey of, pay, uh, you know, showing the overwhelming numbers of patients that, that use um, CAM therapies in, during treatment. Um, and again, the, you know, the, this survey is to looking more at the attitudes and practice of the oncologist side. They're not, they're not trained in this stuff, right? They don't, they don't have the experience. And I think a lot of them, um, a lot of them will just kind of poo-poo a lot of it because they, they, they don't want to sound uneducated, right, to their patients. And so I think when you break that down and don't, and when you have someone else to field those questions and the oncologists aren't getting that on their plate, um, you know, it just makes for a much better, uh, much better patient experience too, because oftentimes the patients want to discuss that stuff with somebody, and if they're not getting the, their questions answered, you know, they, they don't feel like all facets of their care is being addressed. So again, just making a strong case for the collaborative effort between integrative uh, oncology practitioners and conventional medicine, you know. So uh, research. This is an area where Integrative oncology is, is, is growing, but I think we're always going to be a little bit behind the eight ball and, and working uphill, so to speak, because we just lack the funding. We lack the manpower that conventional medicine has. Uh, we don't have big pharma. We don't have these large academic institutes that are you know, throwing a ton of manpower at these, these studies. 
And the, the other thing that I think really affects it is holistic approach and a naturopathic approach um, or just really integrative therapies, uh, they're not really well suited for these single intervention randomized trials, okay? Because it is a holistic approach. It is a systems approach. And when you boil it down to a, you know, uh, this one compound led to this one result or outcome, I think it's just not the best way to study what we do. And so I think there's a lot of people working on more of a systems approach to be able to evaluate these, 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 these uh, types of therapies, which work on multiple levels. Um, and I think you know, that, that will potentially be a game changer when it comes to research for more natural therapies. Um, we do try to focus on the, you know, the highest quality evidence we can. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of experiential and, and anecdotal evidence that we go off of as well. Uh, case studies uh, can be very helpful. Um, I learn a lot going to conferences and just, you know, having those curbside conversations with doctors that I know have experience with certain things. Um, whether there's, you know, human data on it or not, I trust what they've been seeing with their patients. And, and that, that speaks a lot as well. Um, and the overwhelming amount of studies we have for natural therapies in cancer and cancer care have been positive. I mean, there's very few that have shown any type of safety issues, any type of, uh, you know, uh, worse outcomes. There's some to watch out for, but the overwhelming majority uh, of natural therapies are, are very safe and, and have proved that in, in good studies. So I wanted to talk about some of the more evidence-based therapies that we do use in integrative oncology. Um, and so I, I broke it into three categories. The, the first one is, has more to do with um, outcomes, right? So things that actually are having direct anti-cancer effects, uh, whether it's overall survival, progression-free survival, or better response rates when combined with, with conventional treatments. Um, this first one here, obviously, uh, big one here. I know Dr. Dr. Ron, I've heard him say uh, it's kind of the IVC capital of the world. So, and I think that's uh, right on because, you know, they've churned out probably the most amount of, of studies when it comes to IV vitamin C and cancer. Um, and I, I didn't put a bunch of the references in here. I mean, they're obviously out there. I know a lot of them are on the, the Reardon Clinic page, uh, but I'm happy to, you know, produce uh, references if you guys need them. I just wanted to give it more of a, a snapshot and, and not be too busy with the slides. Um, but IV vitamin C really is a cornerstone of integrative oncology. And I think it has applications. I mean, pretty much every patient, you can make a case, no matter what phase of treatment they're in, that IV vitamin C will help to support that patient. Okay? And so... Uh, it, it's one of the best places to start with patients, and I know that's part of the protocol here at the Reardon Clinic is, you know, IVC first, get that going because you're always going to get things moving in the right direction with IV vitamin C. Um, how many of you have heard of mistletoe therapy? Okay, yeah, not that many. So this is something that uh, I'm really excited to bring, you know, to, to, it's something I've been using in my practice and I'm excited to bring to the Reardon Clinic. Uh, mistletoe therapy kind of spawned out of the, the anthroposophic medicine movement, which took place in the early and mid-1900s in, um, in Germany, Austria, uh, Switzerland. Uh, and it's, it's continued to be uh, very heavily used in those countries, as well as a lot of other European countries. A lot of the Scandinavian countries use it. it it's this, uh, this viscum album extract that comes from different mistletoe plants. And mistletoe, you know, it grows on, it's a, it's a parasitic plant. It grows on other trees. And so uh, it's harvested and, um, you know, this extract is produced. And the main way that, that you utilize it in practice is patients self-inject it. It comes in little vials and they start at a very low dose. And you titrate up to a, a certain local reaction you're looking for. And what it's doing basically mechanistically is it's, it's stimulating natural killer cells, stimulating T cells. It's causing a bit of a, a low-grade fever response, which we know is a healing response in the body. 
Um, and so I use this, again, like IV vitamin C, it really is, has applications almost across all tumor types. Um, and uh, that's something that, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's a cornerstone type therapy for, for oncology patients. And, and even for quality of life, actually, a lot of the studies, there's over 200 clinical studies um, on mistletoe therapy, and a lot of them have shown significant improvement in quality of life, um, as well as, again, better responses to treatment. And it's safe to combine with just about every type of conventional therapy, radiation, all the chemos, all the targeted therapies. So again, a lot, lot of applications. Uh, the ketogenic diet, this is kind of a hot topic right now. Um, obviously, some great evidence behind its use, in, in particular with brain tumors. Um, it's not the easiest diet uh, to sustain, and it's, it really needs to be done in a supervised uh, fashion in order to really keep patients in that ketotic state. Um, we had registered dietitians at CTCA that would spend a lot of time with patients on how to educate them, how to count their, you know, their macronutrients, how to use chronometers, um, because if you're kind of, you know, if you're not full blown in that ketotic state, you're not really getting the benefits of the diet. And so it's more of a medical therapy than it is a diet. But um, I think that there's applications for that beyond just brain tumors. Uh, and I use it with a lot of patients. Melatonin, uh, one of my favorite uh, supplements. I, I usually refer to it as my Swiss Army knife of natural supplements because it just has so many benefits uh, throughout the body. Um, Anti-cancer effects through the immune system, detoxification, uh, sleep. Obviously, most people know it as sleep support. Um, helps with mood regulation. Um, but more of the higher doses, 10 to 20 milligrams, is what we try to get cancer patients on because there's actually some great studies um, that came out of Italy uh, back in the 90s. Uh, there was a doctor that just... Uh, I can't remember his name, but he just did a, he published a ton of studies on, on, on high dose melatonin in cancer and showed benefit in breast cancer and in lung cancer and colon cancer um, and really with very little side effects. You know, uh, some patients get some funky dreams, uh, but if you kind of start slow and titrate the dose up, usually you can avoid that. Uh, vitamin D, uh, obviously, you know, this is something we're testing all of our patients for. Uh, I'd say, Gosh, 80, at least 80% of the patients I test, vitamin D is low. Uh, it's very common. Um, and that's, you know, some of it's the lack of sun exposure, but some of it is we know that in a chronic disease state that our vitamin D levels are being, are being brought down through that as well. Uh, so, but the good news is with most cancer uh, studies that have been done on vitamin D3, they've shown that when you replete the levels up to a, a good zone that those patients do much better. So it's very easy to, to bring vitamin D level up with oral supplementation. Um, artemisinin, this is what I'm really excited about. It's, it's something that I'm still kind of dipping my feet into. Uh, I don't know if you have much knowledge with artemisinin, but uh, this, is, uh, this comes from the herb uh, wormwood, which is uh, it's actually an FDA-approved medication for malaria. Um, and so it is available uh, but there's been some studies over the last few years, and um, there's a doctor, um, Saputo, I think, out of California, that's, that he's got a lot of stuff on YouTube about how it works. But it, it has shown some benefit in cancer. Uh, it kind of uh, takes advantage of, a, um, of iron, actually. The iron sequestering that happens in cancer cells, it kind of rides the coattails of the iron into the, into the, into the cells and... Uh, through the ion exchange, and uh, uh, it's been shown to have not only with cancer, but also in chronic infections as well. And this is something that, I, again, I'm still learning a lot about, but I'm excited to hopefully bring this as another therapy to, to our patients here. Um, medicinal mushrooms, use a ton of these. Uh, they're very safe. We have great studies out of Asia mainly. Uh, you know, the beta the main compounds. I use a lot of reishi, a lot of maitake, coriolis, cordyceps. Uh, and these have, you know, there's, there's great human data showing that when you combine these medicinal mushrooms with chemo, patients have better results. So it's, it's a no-brainer. And they're very well tolerated. And you can watch patients when they're, um, 
you know, if they're on chemo and their white blood cell count starts coming down, you get them on, you know, medicinal mushroom supplement and it really takes effect quickly. I mean, I've seen some dramatic increases in white blood cells with, with the medicinal mushrooms. So this is kind of the second category of, of you know, examples of therapies that have good re research behind them, more for side effect support. Um, acupuncture uh, is, God, just, just a great thing to have on board. I like all my patients who are going through treat, active treatment to have an acupuncturist on board because they can help with a lot of the common side effects that you get with chemo and radiation, nausea, vomiting, um, pain. Uh, anxiety, sleep issues. I mean, it's a whole system of medicine in and of itself. So, uh, but, but it's very safe and there's great studies that have been done, large scale studies that have been done on um, acupuncture supporting cancer patients during treatment. Ginseng, I use a lot of that for cancer related fatigue. There's good studies behind that uh, at a Mayo Clinic. Uh, exercise is really, I mean, you know, we shouldn't have to make the case for patients doing exercise, but you know, you'd be surprised. A lot of patients come to me when they're on treatment and they have this notion that they shouldn't be exercising, uh, that, you know, they should just be resting all day, every day while they're getting treatment. And I tell them that's the furthest from the truth. You know, obviously you're going to have days where you're not feeling well and you need to listen to your body, but you need to le maintain your lean, lean muscle mass. We need the cardiovascular benefits of the exercise helps with mood. And it's been shown to help with, you know, overall outcomes, especially in populations like breast cancer, um, colon cancer. Uh, I won't go into each single one of these because I do want to leave time for questions, but I mean, B vitamins, vitamin D, CoQ10 is one that can help with a lot of the cardiotoxicity that comes from some of the chemotherapy agents, uh, namely like doxorubicin, which is a, a common chemo that they treat breast cancer with. A small portion of those patients five to 10 years later can come down with heart problems because they got that, that. And, and taking CoQ10 while they're on that chemo significantly mitigates that risk. Zinc can help with taste changes and alterations in smell, which are very common with head and neck cancers and chemo side effects. Um, cannabis, you know, I, it's it, just a great tool. It can address a lot of issues. Uh, obviously, you know, it, there's still a lot of you know, regulations and laws that, that are kind of uh, making the whole process kind of difficult to navigate for patients and for doctors. Um, you know, and then you got the whole THC versus CBD discussion. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I have hour-long visits with patients just talking about cannabis. I mean, there's a lot of applications for it. Um, <clears throat> and so um, that's something I use a lot for, for pain control. I've been able to get a lot of patients off of um, or at least reduce their amount of narcotic use uh, by getting them on different types of cannabis products. Um, use it a lot to help with appetite, weight loss, nausea. So a lot of applications, and I think we're going to continue to get you know, more and more research uh, uh, done there. I actually authored a, a, an article, if you guys want to look it up, uh, called... Um, <clears throat> Uh, marijuana use in cancer patients, medical marijuana use in cancer patients. Uh, it was published in Current Oncology Reports 2016. So a lot more information there. I usually refer patients to that. It was a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty well-rounded article and talks a lot about the science behind it. <clears throat> uh, so this was kind of the third category I mentioned, uh, more from a preventative standpoint, some therapies that have good evidence behind them. Uh, curcumin. <clears throat> Boy, I mean, you know, there, I think there's been shown to be something like 40 to 50 different mechanisms by which curcumin inhibits cancer cell growth and cancer cell spread and, and development. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is one of the really heavy hitters when it comes to trying to, you know, if you do have significant risk factors, um, you know, getting, getting patients on curcumin, uh, you know, I think is, is, is a great insurance strategy, really, a cancer prevention insurance. Uh, and, and it's also known well for its anti-inflammatory effects, which most patients can benefit from as well. Well tolerated. Uh, <clears throat> there's a few chemotherapy agents that we tend to avoid curcumin with because of some potential herb-drug interactions, but it's really just two or three. Um, 
Melatonin, again, more from a preventative standpoint with breast cancer specifically, they found that um, uh, they've done studies where uh, night shift workers, um, they found that these patients, obviously, they're missing that kind of circadian rhythm at night where most of the melatonin is produced, had much higher incidence and risk of developing breast cancer. And so the melatonin was the missing link that they found out some years later. Um, <clears throat> Vitamin D, and I think also melatonin, I think poor sleep, whether it's at, you know, at the right time or not, a poor sleep and chronic insomnia and sleep disturbances, you know, that significantly hammers down your immune system. And so I think that's another mechanism by which, you know, if, if you're taking melatonin, it's helping you sleep better, you're getting all that regeneration and, and, and immune function that happens when you're in the, that deep REM sleep. And, uh, you know, it's rare that I see patient, cancer patients that don't have sleep problems. You know, it's, it's a very common presenting issue. And that usually it predates, you know, the cancer diagnosis. It's a chronic issue. So you can never go wrong by improving someone's sleep. Uh, vitamin D3, again, it's been shown low vitamin D levels have been associated with just about every type of cancer as far as being sort of a soft prognostic factor. Um, garlic with stomach cancer, some good studies on that. Um, exercise, again, you know, probably, probably the best drug ever invented, uh, you know, regular exercise. Uh, I try to get my patients on, you know, doing something in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 minutes, five days a week of some type of aerobic exercise. Um, you know, a lot of patients will come to me and say, well, you know, I, I, I work all day and I'm just, you know, I have a very laborious job, and, and unfortunately, you only really get the benefits of exercise when it's a continuously elevated heart rate. So most patients at work, yeah, they're doing strenuous activity, but it's start and stop. It's, it, it's not a continuous 20 to 30 minutes of, of, that, of that work. So uh, exercise really is different than just activity on, on the job. Uh, reducing toxic exposure, this, this really doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think, especially with cancer, because there's just, you know, this, this chemical soup that we're all exposed to now. Um, anything you can do to, you know, whether it's just trying to eat more organic, um, reducing, you know, your exposure to plastics and plasticizers, particularly soft plastics, uh, parabens and phthalates, which are in a lot of beauty products, a lot of household cleaners, um, you know, you just, whatever you can do to reduce that load, because, I mean, you, you know, we can't live in a bubble, unfortunately, um, but um, reducing exposure, I think, really can help, can be a, you know, preventative uh, a strategy for a lot of different types of cancers. Dietary measures, uh, we've had some good studies showing that, um, you know, reduced animal protein intake uh, uh, is, is, is huge for preventing certain types of cancer. Uh, increased fiber and fatty acid intake, um, and then avoidance of processed foods, processed sugars. You know, those are kind of <clears throat> what we can kind of on a consensus level say are like the hallmarks of a diet approach for cancer. That said, everybody's diet really you know should be individualized for them. Uh, we do some food allergy testing, uh, and, and it's always nice to know if there's a particular type of, of food that's causing a lot of inflammation in patients. But uh, just from a kind of a, you know, a general standpoint, these are some of the, the things that have been shown through good research to, to stand out. And then lifestyle modifications. I mean, stress reduction is huge, huge. I mean, stress is always that wild card when it comes to not only cancer, but chronic disease. Sometimes that's the part that, you know, <clears throat> doesn't get addressed. And that's, I think, why a lot of patients maybe don't have the best outcomes that they, that they hope for. Because uh, stress leads to chronic inflammation, leads to hormone imbalance, poor sleep, you know, uh, you, you name it. So whatever you can do, whether it's if your stress, stress reduction is exercise or meditation or <clears throat> being in nature, um, you got to have something that you're doing on a regular basis to unplug. Okay, so we got two quick case studies, and we should have some time for questions. Everybody hanging in there? Good. Um, so again, I didn't go into an elaborate um, 
you know, case report or anything, but I just wanted to give you guys a feel for some of these types of patient situations and what I might recommend. Um, and this, this is a very abbreviated version, but uh, first one, we have 63-year-old male with stage three colorectal cancer. So stage three means it's started in the colon somewhere and then it spread to some of the lymph nodes around the colon, but it hasn't spread to any distant sites of, you know, any distant organs, not in the liver, lungs, brain, bones. Um, and so he's undergoing chemo radiation. So usually this is a pretty standard treatment for a stage three colorectal cancer patient. Though they, they receive an oral type of chemo called capecitabine or Zolota. And it can cause a lot of side effects, you know. Uh, past medical history, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, arthritis, uh, signs and symptoms at when he presented weight loss, significant weight loss, loose stools, sleep disturbances, joint pain from the osteo, and, and fatigue. We looked at some of his, his lab work um, and showed low vitamin D and low iron. Now, before I got to this, you know, this sort of treatment plan portion, of course, there was a lot of testing, you know. Um, I always say, you know, don't, when it comes to labs and nutrient testing, you know, you don't, don't guess, test, right? You don't want to just be guessing because everybody's different. It goes back to that biochemical uniqueness, right, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and so you want to see where those deficiencies are. Um, there's other tests sometimes that we look at, like circulating tumor cells, uh, nagalase, uh, these other markers that a lot of conventional oncologists don't use, but they give us a real idea of where the patient's immune system's at, at the level of inflammation that they're dealing with, and actually what's, what's going on in real time with circulating t tumor stem, stem cells. Um, so for this patient, recommended IV vitamin C two to three times per week while they're going through their treatments. Obviously, you titrate it up to tolerance. Um, mistletoe, you know, you'll see a lot of these things are, you know, from my previous slides, but uh, these really are, you know, a lot of the things I use. Um, we start them on mistletoe, uh, and every other day they do an injection, and they, again, titrate that up. Replete the vitamin D and iron. That helped immensely with his energy level, um, to be honest, and his mood. <clears throat> a probiotic helps a, a big side effect of the chemo radiation he was going through was diarrhea because the radiation is being directly um, um, directly focused onto the, the colon, obviously the lower end of the colon there. So that can cause a lot of, you almost get like a sunburn in your rectum there, which can be quite uncomfortable and cause a lot of loose stools. Um, fish oil, of course, with his history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arthritis, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids are, are, you know, definitely need to be on board. Melatonin, both for the sleep support and for the anti-cancer benefits, the immune support. Um, got him set up with our acupuncturist. Uh, cannabis really helped him with his appetite uh, and his pain. Got him doing some gentle exercise, working up to that 20, 30 minutes a week, or 20, 30 minutes a day, uh, five days a week of, uh, of just, you know, brisk walking. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. You don't have to be doing boot camp. You know, it's just, it's just moving. Um, stress reduction, and then again, a high fiber, uh, avoidance of red meat, and daily tree nuts. So it was actually a great study that came out a um, couple of, it's probably two years now, but in colorectal cancer uh, survivors, they looked at, it was a large study too, like five or 600 uh, patients. Uh, they looked at uh, a lot of different things, but one of the things they found was that the patients who had a daily intake of tree nuts had nearly a 50% risk of recurrence, lower risk of recurrence than patients that didn't eat tree nuts. I mean, that's like, if that was a medication, I mean, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't hear the end of it, right? Um, so I always, my colorectal cancer patients, I mean, it's just, it's one of the first things I tell them, you know, just get you a little handful of daily tree nuts and, uh, you know, you got to take advantage of that. You know, I think it's mainly because of the, you know, the essential fatty acids in that, of course, there's lots of other nutrients selenium's big in, in tree nuts. Um, so again, that's everything but peanuts, right? So, which aren't really nuts, they're legumes. So, 
but yeah, so that was that was his kind of treatment plan. So that gives you an idea of kind of, you know, something that might be kind of, and this is where we start, right? This isn't like I gave him this plan and then I was like, okay, it was, you know, good luck. Uh, you know, we this is always, you know, being uh, adjusted and, and uh, tweaked depending on the different issues they're dealing with. And, um, you know, obviously... IV vitamin C and the, the mistletoe, you can get into more maintenance protocols once they've gone through a lot of their treatment. Second one, uh, this was a breast cancer patient, 48-year-old female with stage two. So um, stage two means it's still confined to the breast, but it's, it's a, a larger tumor. Uh, stage one is usually less than two to three centimeters. So stage two is just a larger tumor, but still confined to the breast. Um, hormone positive, so the ERPR, that's estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive, but HER2 negative. So when you hear the term triple negative breast cancer, that means all three of these markers are negative. And that was, those are kind of the, the ones that are, tend to have worse um, overall survival because there's less things less things you can do to treat because you know, we have drugs that block estrogen and the progesterone. We have drugs that block the HER2. It's called Herceptin. Um, so when you don't have any of those markers there, there you know, the conventional approach is mainly just chemotherapy. Um, but for this lady, she'll, you know, she did chemotherapy to start, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which means the chemotherapy they do before surgery, which helps to shrink down the tumor, okay, so that they can get an easier, an easier uh, resection, clear margins, and hopefully avoid having to do a mastectomy. And oftentimes, the chemo does do a good job of shrinking down the tumor. Um, she had this AC regimen, which is a every two week dose dense regimen. Uh, the A is the doxorubicin drug that I talked about that has the cardiotoxicity down the road. So, if you guys remember what I said about that, you'll know one of the supplements that I gave her. Um, and then they, they follow it with uh, 12 weeks of weekly Taxol, which is another chemotherapy. So all in all, it's about a, it's about a four-month regimen for the patients to do this. And you know, each, each cycle is cumulative, and so the side effects start to build up as they go. Um, some of her past medical history, um, she had fatigue, alternating diarrhea, constipation, hot flashes, insomnia, anxiety, depression. Again, very common symptoms in cancer patients. Uh, she had low vitamin D as well and um, low B12. So uh, those are some of the nutrient levels that we, that we addressed. And so, again, did a bunch of testing, did a bunch of further workup, but again, fast forwarding to the, the treatment plan, you know, IVC first, right? That's, that, that's always up there. We did one weekly during her uh, the, the week she was on the treatments and two to three on the off weeks. And that's, I like to stagger it sometimes for patients because they're already getting a lot of, um, you know, a lot done those weeks of treatment. And so sometimes it's not feasible to get uh, two to three on those weeks, but the off weeks definitely try to take advantage of it. Mistletoe therapy, again, we had her on a slightly different one, the Helixer M, which is more indicated for breast cancer. Um, I remember, I think... This is the patient that had, she actually had a huge um, local reaction to the mistletoe. It was probably the size of, it was probably 10 centimeters across in diameter. Um, and she got really high fevers. Um, but she had a remarkable, remarkable response to her treatment, her, her uh, chemo. And I really think that the helixir, the, the mistletoe therapy, it played a huge role in that. I think it really engaged her immune system, kicked everything back into gear. And sometimes you have to have those, we call them healing crises, uh, to kind of get the body kind of shooken up and, and back, you know, back into where it's supposed to be in order to operate and, and get the immune system uh, uh, rolling again. Um, so we did that. We did probiotics to help with the constipation mm -hmm. diarrhea issue. Uh, probiotics, I think, are, again, you know, um, almost every patient could benefit from a probiotic. Magnesium helps with the hot flashes, which is very common in breast cancer patients. The CoQ10, right? Mentioned that about the to help offset that cardiotoxicity. 
uh, melatonin, exercise, got her set up with some mind-body medicine um, uh, type therapies to help with stress reduction and some of the anxiety and emotional uh, stress she was dealing with. And then we did do a food allergy test on her, and I think she had a, a very strong uh, intolerance to, to dairy. And so uh, we cut dairy out completely. Uh, she, had, she actually had almost an immediate weight loss, like a significant 15-pound weight loss within a few weeks after stopping eating dairy. It's just all inflammation and, you know, it just, just, just weighing her down. So sometimes removing, a, you know, an obstacle, like we talked about earlier, you get a lot of bang for your buck, right? She felt better. She had better energy, slept better. All right, we got a little bit of time, right? Okay. Well, that, yeah. Yeah, so if you've moderate. got some general questions that you would like to ask. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Timms will be going on to our call-in. We have a, a call-in schedule. If you go to our website and look under contact, uh, we every, every uh, Monday, Tuesday, now Wednesday, we'll be adding Dr. Timms on Wednesday night and Thursday night. One of our doctors is manning the phone from 5.30 to 6 to take general questions about this. We can't give medical advice, but we can sure try to help you understand what we can do to help out. So do you have a question for Dr. Timms? Yes. Hey. Yes, I wanted, wanted to ask about the use of the infrared sauna, either far or near infrared sauna. Um, I've recommended it to my husband, who's got a, one of these resistant infections. And um, what do you think about that and the use of that with cancer treatment? I've heard that that will kill viruses, bacteria, and, and cancers. So what is your experience with that? Yeah, so the, for the people that aren't in the room, I'll just uh, repeat the question she was asking about the use of uh, infrared saunas and uh, their benefits for cancer patients and other chronic conditions. I, I'm a big fan. I, I think that especially in the you know, prevention stage and the um, uh, uh, survivorship phase makes a lot of sense. I think there's sometimes when patients are going through active chemo or radiation, I don't really like to push detoxification pathways too hard because um, oftentimes you can make patients very, you know, you can almost increase their toxic load. Uh, and that might not be the best time to get patients doing a heavy detox. So I absolutely love saunas, um, uh, but sometimes I think they're more appropriate to be done once they've completed their, their treatment or if they have a break or, you know, some type of, uh, 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 time period where they're not dealing with those active acute side effects of treatment. I think that that's the optimal time to use. Infrared. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, <clears throat> anything you can do to, to reduce that toxic, that toxic burden, right? Like we talked about with the environment and the lifestyle factors, Any, anything you can do, whether it's, you know, saunas or, or, um, you know, uh, different cleanses that are out there. Anything you can do to reduce that toxic burden is going to uh, remove those as an obstacle for your body. Your immune system is always going to function better. All of your systems, your liver, uh, your digestion are all going to work better. So I, I think they're fantastic, and, and everybody could really benefit from them. Okay, Carol. Tim's, um, for a stage four breast cancer patient um, who is taking traditional therapies and yet wants to do and has been doing some supplementing uh, from Reardon Clinic, what can she do now that she has started an extremely powerful uh, cancer drug called Kiskali? Uh, which promises diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And she has been taking C1000 and magne chelated magnesium. Can, what can she do to keep her body going and um, not aggravate the diarrhea? Um, yeah, so the question was, you know, a stage four breast cancer patient uh, who's uh, you know, been doing a lot of uh, integrative support already, but recently started on 
uh, Cascali, uh, newer, you know, uh, targeted therapy for breast cancer, um, and uh, has a pretty high percentage of, of diarrhea as far as a main side effect. You know, I mean, I think there's lots of lots of things that can help with diarrhea. Lots of things that can help to uh, fortify kind of the di- the digestive system. Um, I've used a lot of charcoal with patients. That tends to bind things really well and, and can help with a lot of the treatment-induced diarrhea. Of course, probiotics. Um, L-glutamine powder is something that uh, has a lot of usefulness for those types of issues. It's an amino acid that um, binds to pretty much all the, the enterocytes and, and can shut down some of those uh, toxic-type diarrhea syndromes. Um, there's a specific type of, uh, of probiotic bacteria called Sacro B or Saccharomyces boulardii, which um, if it's more of an infectious type diarrhea, which a lot of times these chemotherapy induced diarrheas become infectious. And that can be a useful, a useful supplement for that as well. Um, so I think, the, and you know, uh, I've seen cannabis as well. Uh, different uh, cannabinoid products, CBD, help, help sometimes. You know, it, it does have some studies with uh, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So um, sometimes that's kind of a, a nice thing to try as well. You could also use liposomal vitamin C, which will not trigger diarrhea, right, right. even in large amounts. And now there's a remag lotion. It's a magnesium lotion that you can put on the skin that you won't get any diarrhea and still get good absorption of magnesium. Yeah, great. One more question. Oops. He'll be around afterwards, too. (laughs) I was just going to ask on the food allergy testing, what Mm -hmm. kind do you recommend since there's so many in different opinions? Yeah, this is, so the question was uh, about, you know, the food allergy testing and what, which is the best, you know, what, there's a lot of different tests out there. I think, um, you know, the validity of a lot of the food allergy tests has been called into question. Uh, you, you know, you got these um, blinded studies where people have sent same specimens to two different labs and they get two completely different reports. Uh, some of the methodology is, is, is different. You know, I know the ALCAT system has been around a long time. Um, but, you know, I think it's a tool. You know, I don't live and die by the results that I see on food allergy testing. Um, you know, there's there's three or four that I've that I've used. Uh, Immunolabs is one that I've tended to steer patients towards, just because I've seen the most consistency. Um, but again, it's not a perfect tool. Uh, it's something that um, can kind of get us started on the on the right path. And if something is really, I usually see with the really high red flag ones, like the plus fours and the ones that are kind of off the roof, that those are usually pretty pretty steady across the board. You know, those are usually reliable. It's more like the, the twos and threes where the patients are having some, you know, some low grade, you know, response to, and sometimes those foods are just kind of noise. They're not really a problem. They're just maybe noise and you don't really focus on those. Uh, but the old, the old gold standard is to just do a, you know, 21 day elimination diet too, which, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. I've actually done it myself, so I can say that, but, um, you know, if you're worried about, you know, not getting the right results and, and taking foods out that you shouldn't, then that's, that's something to fall back on as well. Let's give Dr. Tim's a hand for a really nice presentation. Thank you, Thank you everyone, for coming.